Hello there. Here we are with issue 19, the bonus video. So in this one, we're going to talk about uh, Republic and Alliance Starfighters, the Cohen Share BTLB Y Wing fighter bomber. So I've always liked the Y Wings. I don't know why. Um, I always thought they were just pretty cool. Um, and uh, I like both variations. I like the ones that the Republic had, which is this, and then um, I like the ones like this that later on the um, uh, Resistance or uh, the Rebellion had. So I um, always liked these. I always thought they were pretty cool. It's kind of, I, I'm not quite sure where I sit on Y-Wing versus X-Wing. Uh, the X-Wing has a special spot because that was Luke's ship and, and, uh, I'm a huge Luke fan. So, um, anyway, let's get going. So, developed by Konsei, uh, manufacturing the first Y-Wing Starfighter, the BTLB was deployed in haste during its testing phase. Despite this, it proved invaluable during its first mission, destroying the malevolence uh, feared ion cannon during the Clone Wars. So if you've seen the Clone Wars, you've seen this episode. And um, so much later, the Y-Wings joined the fight against the dreaded Death Star. Uh, the ship was conceived as a multi-role attack starfighter and light bomber that would be able to fight its way to its target with minimal support, deliver its payload of high explosives, and return unharmed. Ready for its next mission, the Y-Wing was considered vital to the Republic and Re Rebel Alliance war effort and remained in service, albeit in different guises, for many years. So, one of the things I always kind of think about with the Y-Wing, knowing that it's supposed to be rugged and all that kind of stuff, is one of the things I would, I think one of the reasons why I like it is because uh, it somewhat makes me think of the A-10 Warthog. And that is by far my favorite uh, jet fighter attack craft um, in, like, ever. Um, it's, to me, it's just like the ultimate, you know, it's uh, got, like, triple redundancy on everything and, and super durable and just freaking cool. I mean, uh, so uh, it doesn't get much more badass than an A-10 Warthog, if you ask me. So the the Y wing always kind of reminded me of that somehow because of you know probably it's supposed to be more durable and all that kind of stuff, but we'll kind of get into some of its durability things um, here in a minute. So just kind of go through some of the stuff. Its length is 23.4 meters. Its uh, speed is 100 uh, megalite. Its maximum speed is a thousand kilometers per hour, uh, which is kind of slow-ish. Its affiliation is Republic. It's got medium laser cannon, paired a uh, set of uh, AR mech SW-4 ion cannons, which is important. Uh, the MG-7 proton torpedo launcher with six torpedoes each and a proton and proton bombs. And its shielding is a cam pet uh, deflector shield. So uh, very durable. Uh, I guess we kind of. Fast forward. So it's uh, shaped in configuration, uh, consists of a wedge shaped cockpit module trailed by a reinforced uh, central par, uh, spar that is home to a rear gunner position. So there's the rear gunner position, uh, secured uh, by the long pylon. Uh, the crossbar in each end of the crossbar is secured by a long pylon that houses both a sublight engine and the ship's hyperdrive. So, um, it was, where did I read that? Uh, uh, its reputation for durability was mainly due to its titanium reinforced fuselage, uh, that, that in conclusion of the Kempa deflector shields and heavy armor panels that provided additional backup to the ship's shields. So, in this configuration, amazingly durable because of all the, the kind of the triple redundancy of the, um, uh, it's beefiness, right? So uh, the Y-Wing Starfighter has the distinction of being the Rebel Alliance's first hyperdrive-equipped starfighter. 
which allowed its pilots to travel through hyperspace to a distant sector, engage and destroy their targets, and finally escape through uh, back through hyperspace before any Imperials could react. However, the ability to travel through hyperspace required the help of an astromech droid to serve as a navigator by storing the necessary jumper coordinates. So that's um, pretty significant. And we know that the X-Wings had hyperdrive and all that kind of stuff. But we also know that the Jedi fighters did not have hyperdrive. They had those rings that would attach to their ship. And that um, uh, is what they used for a hyperdrive. Uh, so um, not quite as um, capable. You know, they'd have to drop the ring and then hope that either somebody was going to pick them up or they'd be able to get back to the ring. So that's pretty important. Um, so, uh, just gonna, here it talks about, uh, to provide additional, uh, defense against attacks from the rear and the sides, the secondary tur uh, laser turret with rear gunner is in a very exposed bubble. This was installed behind the pilot and in front of the astromech socket. So, um, it's kind of important to note that, uh, that was gone in the rebel alliance they didn't have that rear gunner position so that's that's a uh, kind of significant so clone trooper pilots um clone trooper pilots were initially picked at random from ranks of normal clones and trained to be as uh, pilots and technicians as the clone war progressed however a new breed of clones was raised to fly the latest republic starfighters while they could fly most ships deployed by the republic many were trained to specialize in one particular craft. So that's always important. Uh, there were specialized helmets that carried yellow markings and red Republic symbols. So it's interesting. Um, I'll have to pull up, I'll put up a, a image of what the actual Republic symbol is supposed to be, or what I always thought it was. Um, but this is what they say the Republic symbol is, and um, I can tell you that's very close to what the, uh, the Imperial symbol is. So they didn't really uh, change it much, but I know the Republic symbol it was actually supposed to have been different, I thought. Um, and I'll, like I said, I'll put that up right there. So um, this is what uh, where it talks about the, the Malevolence. So as uh, General Grievous' flagship, Malevolence became... The Terror of the Outer Rim, Anakin Skywalker approached uh, Cohen's Air, which was still putting the finishing touches on the first Y-Wings at, at its testing facility in the orbit around the planet Bormis. Taking the ships he needed, Skywalker assembled Shadow Squadron for a dangerous mission in defense of a Republic med, uh, med Center near Kaleida Shoals, which was about to be attacked by General Grievous. As the Y-Wings approached, Grievous fired the flagship's Ion Cannon destroyed two Y-Wings immediately. However, while the clone pilots took more losses, they remained calm under the command of Skywalker. Finally, the remaining starfighters were able to avenge their colleagues by firing torpedoes straight into the heart of Malevolence's feared ion cannon and disabling the flagship before fleeing. So, if you've seen this episode, basically, uh, Grievous had this, uh, this ship, the Malevolence, and had this huge... Uh, ion cannon on the side and they couldn't really aim it or anything they would just line up the ship and then fire this massive just ion burst and it would basically render everything uh, inoperable and then they would just come in and, and uh, destroy it you know clean it up after the fact and um, during that process what they would do is they would go in and make sure that they killed everybody in lifeboats and all that kind of stuff. So that way there was zero, um, you know, kind of witnesses or anything like that. So it was easy for them to say, you know, you know, kind of have this, this amazing fear of this huge super weapon. I mean, it was kind of a super weapon, but it wasn't like it just killed them outright. You know, it just disabled them and they'd come in and uh, kill it later. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm trying to see if there was anything else that was uh, significant. Uh, talks about the bubble, uh, gun turret. Um, the, I thought this was rather interesting. The brave clones who took up 
this position were highly respected as the gunners never saw the danger the pilots were flying towards only what they were flying away from many of them adopted a gung-ho attitude towards their role uh, Steve, uh, a little behind the scenes here, Steve Golly's early Y-wing blueprints dating back to September 1975 reveal a torpedo tube underneath the cockpit, as well as central aluminum support tubes used in its uh, center engine pod. While these, were, while these drawings remain important to recording the design process, they were not necessarily, necessarily followed precisely by industrial light magic or when the vehicle was built on set in England. As the film got bigger and bigger, Galling stopped drawing the blueprints and eventually joined Lauren Peterson and others as a model maker. During the attack of the Death Star, the Y-Wings were quickly picked off, and only three ever shared the screen at, in, at one time. The fragile nature of the models also meant that they needed several repairs during the brief filming. So yeah, the... The, I'm guessing these parts here and stuff were pretty fragile and they would break. But, uh, uh, yeah, it was always pretty interesting. So, that when they, one of the things they did talk about was, um, it talks about it over here. Uh, in later models, Rebel technicians just, uh, decided to strip away the heavy armored panels, reducing time required for maintenance, but exposing the ship's superstructure and making it somewhat more susceptible to damage. In addition, the overall length of of later models were trimmed by up to eight meters by reducing the size of the cockpit area and the cowlings to cover the ion exhaust from the engines. So basically, the some of the later models did not have the rear gunner position, so that's why they weren't, you know, you didn't see them in later uh, things. Visiting Geonosis. So uh, let's have a quick look here. So it's uh, slightly smaller than Earth, 11 point uh, uh 11,370 kilometers uh diameter uh, it's very temperate and arid it's 90 percent standard gravity it's mountainous ma uh, mesas barren desert and only has five percent surface water so that's kind of significant so one of the things this talks about is how uh the asteroid belt happened around geonosis and um Basically, that uh, 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 because of this this uh, random meteor impacts caused the uh, localized extinctions of uh, of the uh, different creatures and stuff on Geonosis, and the Geonosians retreated underground into caves and stuff to survive. Um, you know, they they had a hard time surviving on the uh, um, on the surface and that kind of stuff. So um, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on Geonosis. I mean, if you've watched Attack of the Clones and um, even in the Clone Wars, they talk about it. Um, but it, it's um, kind of an interesting planet. I thought it was interesting how they kind of gave a reason why it was the way it was. And that was this uh, where they um, asteroid built uh, uh, what it was caused. Um, eons ago, a rogue comet smashed into the largest moon of Geonosis, uh, sending debris hurtling towards the planet. It rained down upon the surface, battering it into ruin and killing almost all life forms. So there you go. That's how Geonosis happened. And then um, they eventually created these spires and stuff. And, and uh, uh, a lot of their, their cities and stuff uh, actually resembled natural landforms and so it was kind of hard to even tell that that was a populated uh, uh, planet so uh, this here just basically talks about um, when Obi-Wan and Jango Fett fought in the uh, asteroid belt but again you guys have seen uh, Attack of the Clones so um, basically Jango Fett, Boba's father uh, chased Obi-Wan and, and uh, they had a dog fight and Obi-Wan made him think that he was killed by dumping a bunch of his spare parts and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, very interesting. So behind the scenes here, uh, sandcastles for the uh, motion control sequence showing Count Dooku's escape across the Gene Ocean Desert at the end of Episode 2, ILM built a vast model over 12 meters square the miniature sandscape was covered with sand dunes made from crushed walnut shells, a material 
which is used industrially as a mild abrasive for polishing metal surfaces. These scenes were given a redder hue in possible post-production. Oh, in post-production. So it's kind of interesting they use uh, the walnut shells because anybody that does uh, train modeling, um, the ballast for the, the train tracks is, uh, in most cases, is, is crushed walnut shells. And uh, they're colored and all that kind of stuff to give different uh, different colors, but uh, yeah, so it, it, I mean, it, it does the trick, you know. So, uh, Gene Ocean Ruler, in lead up of the first battle, Gene Ocean's uh, Archduke Pogel, the lesser, killed the Gene Ocean Ruler, Hades the Vaulted, and took over the planet, pledging its resources to Count Duco of the CIS as leader of Gene Ocean's and a member of the Techno Union. Pogol controlled the vast droid factory set up on his planet, but he gradually outgrew his usefulness in the, to the Sith, who had inst, uh, instigated the conflict and was killed by Darth Vader on Mustafar at the end of Clone Wars. So yeah, there you go. There's a little bit of that. Emergency equipment. Secrets of space flight. So, uh, like any experienced starship captain, Han Solo and his first mate Chewbacca made sure that they had essential equipment to deal with any conceivable emergency on board the Millennium Falcon. So, one of the things that you have to worry about, particularly on a spaceship, would be fires. I mean, that would devastate a spaceship in a hurry. Uh, one of the, <laughs> there you go, one of the biggest risks is, um, uh, space flight is electrical fires, fed by the ship's air supply internal, uh, conflagrations are the stuff of spacers' nightmares, destroying vessels from within to make them implode and in the unforgiving vacuum. Uh, given the hazards of their occupation, Solo and Chewbacca installed several handheld fire extinguishers around the ship. One set went in the cockpit where the crew spent most of their time, and more were located near every hatch of the ship. But extinguishers are only effective when a crew member is on hand to fight fires. That is why, like many other ships, the Falcon also fitted is also fitted with an uh, automated built-in firefighting apparatus. Although it can't always be relied upon to put out the flames, the system includes a network of pressurized canisters containing anti-incendiary gas and high-expansion suppression foam, also known as fire foam, deposited around the ship. And e uh, each is attached to a computer-controlled nozzle that releases gas and foam in the event of fire. So, and of course, like everything on the, the Falcon, it's temperamental and prone to failure because of its age, even though Han Solo uh, was careful to maintain his equipment regularly. The automated network failed when the Falcon took several uh, bolts during dogfight with the first Death Star sentry ties before the Battle of Yavin, and that's where R2 came in and put out the fire uh, so that's why we get to see r2 putting out the fire there uh, so then we're going to get into the uh romer uh, six breathe masks uh compact romer six use uh uses a mask that fits tightly over the user's mouth and nose depending on the species it contains an integrated com link the gas tank purifier unit can be strapped to the body worn on the belt or carried in a pocket used as an air purifier its six filters can provide breathable air for six hours probably where the six comes from in the name uh, while the tank provides a 10 minute supply for use in atmospheres with no breathable gas so th i thought this was pretty cool um this here actually talks about uh uh, where that came from, the breathing apparatus used in the Millennium Falcon is based on a standard type of emergency medical services, adult non-rebreather mask used in medical emergencies uh, where a patient is unable to breathe unassisted by, uh, but requires a higher, or is able to breathe uh, unassisted, but it requires a higher concentration of oxygen. The mask's cheap elastic strap was replaced with an adjustable one from a uh, scuba diving mask and the props come uh and the props compact gas canister was assembled from scrap parts so yeah <laughs> they didn't do anything special they just got one from uh some e uh emts 
Uh, the Gliss Emergency Med Pack, the basic general life sustaining emergency med pack manufactured by uh, Chewab, uh, contained treatments for fractures, cuts, contusions, burns, traumatic injuries. Its computer was reprogrammable to suit thousands of different species, although it could only handle one type of patient at a time. So you had to select it and then it would treat that one patient. So, and this kind of talks about uh, this. Um, uh, they were uh, well, med packs and which were commonly specified on the YT-1300. So it was kind of a specific thing, or not a specific, but uh, they were pretty common to see on the YT-1300s. Uh, it monitored the patient's vital signs and uh, in a database of treatment procedures. Uh, so that was kind of uh, interesting. Then uh, this is what Leia used on Luke when after they rescued him from Cloud City, and Vader had cut off his hand. So uh, yeah, those are a pretty important. Uh, had a nerve regenerator, tissue regenerator, and sonic scalpel. So there you go. That's the the whole part with the the med packs. And then we have a little bit here on the recess detail. So that's what we did in this issue here. So let's kind of go over the behind the scenes there. With far fewer features on the underside of the model than the top, the darkness of the two four-sided four recess on the hull and four circular pits on the mandibles appear particularly prominent in the action sequence for which the filming miniature was brightly lit. So... Yeah, that you, you get to see inside there quite a bit because of uh, uh, they wanted you to be able to see it because it was uh, uh, you know some of the only detail that you're going to see along the bottom specifically. So uh, that's always pretty important. And that concludes issue 19. And in issue 20, uh, we have. Um, we have, uh, I think we've kind of discussed this, uh, these these wall parts here with some of the cushions that go on them, some more uh, framework and uh, all the screws and the, the little uh, brackets or whatever you want to call them uh, associated with that. So that's what we'll be doing in issue 20, uh, at least I'm guessing so because uh, uh, we don't have enough pieces here to be doing uh, uh, probably uh, any of the framework, so we'll just be working on this wall. So that should be a fairly short uh, issue, I would I would guess. So, uh, yeah. So that is issue 19. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Um, I do want to kind of put out that uh, uh, I'm going to be doing after issue 20. I'm going to be doing a review of everything thus far, and um. In that review, uh, I'm thinking about maybe doing that as a stream. So if you guys would be interested in seeing that, let me know. Uh, and uh, I would like to do the stream sometime when uh, there's not a bunch of other people streaming. Uh, uh, I don't want to, you know, take away viewership from them. You know, they're uh, normal streamers and that kind of stuff. and They, they deserve to not have me steal any of their viewers. Um, and likewise, I, I'd like to have as many people view as possible. So uh, if you guys have a suggested time to do that, let me know. And, uh, uh, you know, if a day, a specific day seems better than others, that'd be great. We'll have a look at that. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. And I'll see you in issue 20. May the force be with you always.